I finally made it into the group. Sorry for the delay of about five minutes. I was struggling with my using the external um, webcam and I just couldn't seem to get things to talk together. So I had to do a little bit of technical stuff to get that working. So hopefully you're going to find the video okay and uh, you'll be joining me soon. If you are watching, please go ahead and type a comment into uh, the chat there so that I know that you're here with me. And I'm just going to start explaining what it is that prompted me to decide sharing this sort of a, a video with you. Um, it started a number of years ago um, when I was first starting out with stained glass and I wanted to be able to make uh, some little ornaments for everybody and I didn't have a lot of glass and I didn't have a lot of skill and I really didn't know what I was doing <laughs> and um, I like to try and design my own patterns. So this is one of the little snowflakes that I had made years ago uh, to give as a gift for Christmas and it was just kind of done on the fly and I'm going to show you how I do this sort of a, a creation at least at that point I don't really do that much more uh, much anymore because I'm often working on commissions and things like that so in any case I'm just waiting to see if we have anybody watching it looks like we do good so can everybody hear me all right hopefully the sound is okay again I had to coordinate the microphone with the camera and everything so um, I hope everything's working there Sheila hello glad that you could join me um, okay so what I've done is to get things started a little bit easier for everyone and the hardest thing about making a snowflake is making it geometric or symmetrical as far as how far everything is spaced so what I, I've done is I've created a template and Let's see if we can pick it up properly. So it's just very something very simple, kind of like a bullseye. Um, and it has your six sort of prongs sticking out, if you will. I didn't have a chance to upload this into the group yet this morning. I will after the live video is done. And this is just a template to help you lay out your glass pieces so that they, uh, they line up the way that you want them and they look nice and symmetrical. Hi, Barbara, Becky. Great, thanks for confirming, Sheila. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna point the camera down and I'll show you what I've been working on. I only uh, finished dealing with my last order this morning, so my last commission left this morning, and ever since then I've been scrambling trying to get all the glass pieces prepped. They're not quite as far as, along as I had hoped, but uh, we can chat and talk about stuff while I'm working on those, and then I will be demonstrating how to solder the projects together too. All right, so here we go. Okay, you don't need my phone in the picture, I suppose. And I'm getting warnings on the computer, so I'll get rid of those. Okay, so what I do um, when I'm trying to figure out how to design something, I often just play with little doodles, but when I was first starting out and I knew I wanted to make geometric shapes like uh, snowflakes, I started out by just cutting different shapes of paper. So some are made into, uh, a bit of a, a diamond shape and some are kind of oblong Try get this into the view better for you um, so they're not all the same shape and here's like a it's almost like a teardrop but it's it's pointed and other little shapes like this some squares different sizes of squares if I can pick them up it'll work much better um, and then today when I was doing it <clears throat> excuse me I kept overlapping pieces and because they were all green I couldn't see anything so I also cut out some blue so <coughs> pardon me you can actually cut out different colors and that will help you be able to see where you're stacking your papers and everything is the view okay for the, for this or would you like it just a little bit closer I could play with moving the camera a little bit closer to the table if need be just let me know so in the case of the one that I did years ago um, the shape of the pieces that I cut out were actually this shape so it's kind of like a rectangle, but the corners are knocked off. And then they were placed around here. That's one of those shapes. And then I just put little squares in between them. And then I used three of these little gem type things. I call them globs. I don't know what you all call them. But uh, yeah, I just used three of these. And I 
ended up putting it on like a second layer. Let's see if you can see. So see, you can see that the beads are actually stacked on top of the glass. So there's lots of different things that you can do, um, but having little cutouts of paper make it easier for playing with designs instead of trying to draw everything symmetrical and then saying, I don't like it and starting over. It's a lot easier to be able to use just little cutouts and then move them around the circle. And you can play with the spacing too. So you can bring them in, you know, tight, tight together or you can space them out and then try and fill it in with other sorts of shapes. Now, the one thing you have to keep in mind is that you won't be able to really overlap in the center where you're connecting pieces because then um, there's just not enough space really to be able to do that. So you would want to turn these around perhaps this direction. But by being able to cut it out, it just makes it so much easier to play, uh, which is really the fun of designing. So um, you can do something like that and then you can build a much larger snowflake. The biggest thing to keep in mind when you're building something larger is you want to make sure that it has a good uh, structural soundness to it. If you have too many pieces that are long and it actually creates a hinge point, which would be something that would allow it to actually fold along one whole line, then you're going to be looking for uh, difficulties uh, down the road with that because it's not going to be stable. Um, and if you want to learn more about the hinge points in that, if you go to my blog at livingsunglass.com, uh, there are a couple of articles there about hinge points to explain what they are, how to identify them, and how to fix them. Um, so, yeah, so this is really what it all boils down to, is just kind of playing with the pieces and, and lining them up. And you can make all sorts of different shapes and designs. And then you just make sure that when you are deciding on what you like, as far as a final sort of shape goes, you need to make sure that you've got enough pieces that are overlapping. You need them to be not overlapping necessarily, um, but touching so that it creates that stability. So let's say I were to do something like this. Try and find all the same shapes here. So if I were going with something like this here, all the way around, then I would need to make sure that I actually had something in between those pieces to brace them. I know I have six of each piece here, but they're going to play hide and seek with me right now. There we go. And there should be one more. Anyhow, you get the idea. Um, and then you would want to make sure that these are secured because this, this little bit of touching in here isn't going to make a very strong sun catcher. So you need to do more to make sure that everything uh, is nice and solid. So let's see if I add something else. Oh, here, let's do something like this. And this is really the nice thing about it. You just play with it until you find a design that you like that'll be strong enough to do whatever size of a piece that you're wanting to do. So I can't find the other pieces that match these right now. Um, so that looks good. They're not touching though, so we would need to do something more. So perhaps we could actually put beads over top just like I had shown you on the one that was already finished. And you'd obviously want to coordinate your, your colors. But you can use this sort of a template to play with the designs and figure out what you want to do. You could even do this sort of a thing with some squares. Though it doesn't seem to be that it's going to balance out very well. So maybe that's not a great idea. Oh, this one tipped there. See, that's why those lines on the circle are important. They help keep you going straight with things. So anyway, that, that's how you can do that sort of thing. And, and perhaps you want something that has more of a point. Let's forget all the rest of this. But if you want something that comes out with a point like this, well, you could do it, but you do need to brace it. So you could put two little round beads on either side. That would help stabilize that. Or you could even use little square pieces and put them in there like this. Does that make sense? Let me know if you're following what I'm trying to explain here. It can be a little bit vague at times. If you're, if you're really, really new at this, it can be challenging to know what's going to stabilize something and what won't. 
Um, but playing around with the designs like this, making sure that it's a simplified shape um, that you can keep building onto that makes things solid. So for example, this one here, it's also very compact. This thing is only, grab a ruler, looks like it's about four inches. Yeah, it's just under four inches. And so it's nice and compact, which means that that also helps make it a little bit more solid and stable too. Just check in the comments here. Hello from San Francisco, hi. Wow, great that you could join us. Sandra, that's okay. I was a little bit late getting to the show today too because I was having trouble with the tech side of things. So uh, I hope this makes sense as far as making the designs go. So what I did is when I was playing around with these, I actually kept my phone nearby and I used the camera and I just took pictures, how well you can see that, of diff whoops, different orientations or different designs that I had made. So we're gonna make this one today and that's the same one only the center was different. We're not doing that one because that, that one I thought was uh, a bit too complex. Let's see if I can get this without a glare on the screen. So there's lots of beads piled in the middle here, and I just thought it was gonna be a little bit too complex for our video today. Which way am I going? And there's another simple style that could be done. And another one where I was saying you can use the beads on either side. There we go. The beads on either side of the uh, squares to help stabilize things. And this one we're gonna do today. It's a nice, simple little design. So anyway, once you've played around, you just take some pictures of them. And then once you're all done, you'll get a feel for which ones you like and you can go back and visually see them again, uh, kind of like a, a quick synopsis when you're done. And then you can decide which ones you wanna do and then cut those appropriate shapes. So as I mentioned, I was scrambling, trying to get this all ready for us today and I didn't quite have enough time. So I did start foiling, but I'm just, going to finish this one up. I didn't get a chance to actually foil any of the others. So as far as uh, conversation goes, uh, if you guys have questions, please feel free to ask. It doesn't necessarily have to be completely related to today's project. I might not be able to explain or demonstrate something if it's completely off topic, but I can always try my best to just put it into words so that you would understand the answer. <clears throat> <clears throat> and what's really awesome about these little snowflakes too is uh, you can raid your scrap glass bins because your pieces are all very small usually and uh, you can design them to be as big or as small as you'd like and you can just go through your your bins pick out some glass I like to use clears and blues I've done some with purples and reds and stuff before just for a little shock of color but the uh, the blue ones, I don't know, I guess maybe just because it's a little bit more, more realistic as far as the color choices go, they, they just look a little nicer. And for the glass itself, if you have anything that's iridescent, uh, that makes a nice little accent on the pieces. And I've never done a snowflake completely with iridescence. I like the iridescent coating on the glass, but personally I find it can be a little bit too much when it takes up a very, very large area. But I'm a plain Jane like that, so. <laughs> Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin. Wow, thanks for joining us guys, this is great been a long time since I've done a live inside the Facebook group and I've never actually done one quite like this before so this will be fun okay so uh, for foil I'm just using a 732nd foil and I'm doing these with a silver back uh, just because I'm going to leave them silver as snowflakes are light and shiny and I usually do things with black I love black finish on the stained glass piece but for the snowflakes they are much nicer in the silver and because these are small enough well especially this one 
You could even use it as a Christmas tree ornament. And then if, you, if you're like me and your Christmas tree is covered in stained glass, um, if your floors are a bit soft and people walk by and the floors bounce a little bit, all of the ornaments kind of wiggle on the tree and then they glisten and catch the light. It's really, really quite pretty. Sarah is joining us from Toronto. That's great. And Catherine, New Jersey. Wow, we have folks from everywhere. I know there was someone yesterday in the group too asking um, for the, the conversion on the time. Um, she's from the UK, so we might even have people from overseas joining us. Who knows? So these pieces have all been cut and ground and I washed them all off before and dried them and so they're ready to be foiled. Now because I was rushing a little bit to get these done, I only had an hour to cut and grind all of these. Um, so I was rushing a little bit to get through them. I know they're not all quite perfect, but that's okay. No two snowflakes are the same. So we're going to say that it makes everything unique and original, right? <laughs> and actually to also to say and I didn't realize this when I pulled this one out today and I laid it down on this template to see where the lines are you can see none of it's not square like it's not they're not centered properly around the circle uh, so you live and learn you uh, pick, you pick up tricks as you go along Oh, we have someone from the UK. Oh, was, was Sandra, it was you, okay. I'm glad you were able to join us. I actually had to go and look up a, an online converter to uh, try and figure it out because I had no idea what the time difference was at all. I'm glad it worked out. So have you guys made snowflakes before? And if you have, uh, have you just kind of gone at it like this where you've you've designed your own and done it on the fly or was it something that you followed a pattern or used bevels for because bevels can be beautiful for snowflakes I didn't grab any bevels to use today because I wanted to be able to show you how to do this from scrap glass France. Wow. Welcome, Bob. This is great. All right. So, um, what was I going to say? I had a thought there. There's a police car going by outside. Not sure if the sirens get picked up on the audio or not. Yeah. So when you're uh, foiling, you just want to make sure that you're placing your glass as centered as possible. And this glass can be a little bit trickier because it is heavily textured. And so you're just going to aim for the middle. And it does take practice. I actually bought a little gadget uh, to apply foil. I have one that I got in a lot of stuff that I bought from someone who was getting out of it. Um, but it was for a much narrower foil and I never used that size. So I never actually got to play with it. I think it's a Glass Star one. It's on the other side of the room. Uh, I think it's made by Glass Star, and I was going to give that a try and maybe do a YouTube video for that. Um, it's basically like a little stick, and then the foil kind of feeds through it, and then you can just sort of wrap it around the edge, and it's supposed to lay it down perfectly centered. But like I said, I haven't given it a shot yet, so <laughs> that'll be something for the new year probably. Never made them. I'm just reading some comments here. This is the first. What is the template you're using? Okay, it's no problem that you joined late, Sarah. Um, this is a template that I made up this morning uh, that I am going to be including in the group. I just didn't have a chance to upload it yet. So I will be putting that up sometime this afternoon after we're done the video. But uh, I used Glass Eye, which is a uh, software for designing uh, glass like stained glass patterns and designs. And I like it because it's very easy to segment pieces. So I could actually make the circle and then segment it into six pieces. Uh, so it worked out really easily to be able to do that on there. So I will upload a PDF into the group later. And it's just so that the 
when you're creating your pieces, you can easily lay it down, lay all the pieces out, and you know that they're at the right degree, basically, along the circle, and that you're, you're straight. So if, if this is like this, it should actually be right along that line, so you can push that over, and it allows you to make things more symmetrical much more easily. So that's the idea behind this. So it's just kind of looks like a bullseye. And I didn't know how hard it was going to be see, to see through the glass. I didn't know what kind of glass I was going to choose to do these pieces. And so I just made it so that it had alternating lines of thin and thick, just so that it was easier to see where you were on the circle if the glass was harder to see through. What glass is that? Okay, so the glass I'm using right now is, honestly, these are all from my scrap. I don't know what most of them are. This is a heavily textured, it looks like it's a granite, but I'm not certain. Um, it's a clear glass and it has, this camera doesn't like to focus on things very well. There we go. So you can see there's texture on there. This is perfectly clear though. There's no ear or anything on it. It's just a plain clear glass and I have some other ones here. I'm using a glue chip. These little ones that I did already, this is a glue chip. So that's where it's a clear glass and it has like little frosted effects in places across it. Uh, so that's what that one is. And then I do have for the third snowflake, the one over here, uh, the white, this is, this is a Spectrum Wispy glass. There are two, I don't remember which code it is, there are two white wispy glasses and one is more dense with the wispiness and the other one is a little more translucent. Uh, this is the denser one. And then the other one here. This, this I think is a spectrum as well. I believe that's the rough roll and it's a clear iridescent. So you see that sparkling on there. Ah, oh, you don't really see the sparkling on there. Oh, that's a bummer. Anyway, this one is irid. How about I put some white behind it? Will that make a difference? There, you see that pink and greenish sort of coloring? That's the iridescent color on there. So those are the glasses that I chose. This is also a spectrum. I always worked with spectrum glass before. That's um, I like the colors. I did a lot of teaching too in the studio here, and it was always the easiest one that I found that gave the best results for students. Uh, plus, it was nice to have the full color palette available with the sample set for taking custom orders. So I dealt mostly with spectrum. But you can use anything you like. You can even use um, an opaque glass. I mean, this white one is opaque. I mean, you can't see my fingers through that at all, uh, but I am pairing it with the iridescent clear just to give it that lighter effect. I've made them, but drew out pattern on paper. This looks like a great method. It's, um, it, it can be fun. I, you can, if you've got kids or grandkids or anybody around too, I mean, you can let them kind of create a design too. Maybe that would be a great way to make one for them, let them design it and you can make sure that it's you know, stable and things like that. But um, it's a little bit more freestyle instead of having to draw it like I was saying before, draw it and then look at it and say, eh, I don't like it and then start over. Especially when you're trying to make it symmetrical because <laughs> things look so different when they're symmetrical compared to when they're not. So if you're just doodling and it's not symmetrical, uh, it's not gonna give you quite the same look as what the finished piece would be if it were. Uh, so drawing it symmetrical takes a bit of time. So anyway, this was just a way that I found was a, a fun way to come up with different designs. And you can cut out diamond. Diamond shapes work really well for the snowflakes. And you can make them where they're, you know, a perfect diamond shape where both ends of it are the exact same length. Or you can make ones that are, well, that doesn't show very well in the light, um, like this where it's sort of, more like a teardrop, but it's all squared off.
And then what you can always do too is um, if you like the idea of doing things this way and, and you find you enjoy it, you can make little template pieces like this. This is just a, um, a cardstock paper. So it's a little bit thicker, like a construction paper kind of. Um, but you could even use cereal boxes to get a nice thin cardboard that cuts easily. And the, the templates last a really, really, really long time. You can trace around them with your markers and trace and trace. The edges will get a little bit damp from the markers, but they won't warp like paper will. And they won't wear away like paper will too. So, And just throw them in a little baggie, a little Ziploc bag, and uh, hang on to them for next year. So I had been hoping to have most of the foiling done, so I apologize that it wasn't all finished ahead. But it's nice to be able to show you this part too in case you have questions about foiling. Okay, so we'll give these a quick burnish. Now, I did talk about using these little bead things, these little gem beads, and I'm gonna show you a little bit later, once we get over to those, what um, what you can do to burnish those really easily instead of having to sit there with a little fid like this and try and flatten them all out. So I'm also going to show you here these little tiny ones. When you're working with tiny, tiny pieces, they can be a bit of a challenge. And so you can see here actually where I overlap the pieces, where I start and stop the foil. Try to get the focus on that. Come on. Sorry, let's see here. There, so see where I stopped and started right along that edge? There's like a step. They didn't line up. There you go. So they didn't line up. So what you do when you get that kind of thing is if you just take a little utility knife or craft knife, you can just trim that off. Trim it after you've burnished it though because if it's not stuck down really well, you'll just tear the foil and make a mess. So you want to make sure that you trim those off and then nobody even knows it was ever there. So if you mis misplace the, uh, the two overlapping ends and are not perfectly even, it's a simple little way to fix it and make it look much tidier. And I often have that issue when I'm doing smaller pieces. That's just because you can't get your fingers in there as easily <laughs> to place the foil properly. It happens on big pieces too and I don't have an excuse for that. So is everybody still, uh, is everybody done all their Christmas presents that they're making for glass? Or are you still sort of trying to cram, cram in a few more gifts before, before Christmas Day arrives? In all honesty, I actually have a couple pieces I have left to finish too. Hey Angie, looks like you just joined us too. Your name came in in bright green, and I don't know why yours is and no one else's. I don't know how you guys can see the names on the chat box there. If anybody knows, that would be, be interesting to know why. There we go. Okay, so I have two snowflakes completely done and ready to go. And I'm just going to finish off this one here so that we can. once I get into soldering, we can just solder away. And these shouldn't take too long because they're all straight edges, which make it a little bit easier for placing the foil. Kasha, is that, is, did I pronounce that properly, Kasha? You're cramming your gifts in. Well, one leaded piece and some foiled ornaments. Well, good luck to you. I know it's never fun to have to try and fit things in right at the very end and under all that pressure and something goes wrong. It's, I don't know, I, I always freak out. <laughs> If you're working on a leaded piece, it must be a little bit bigger, I imagine. <clears throat> Probably should have put some Christmas music or something on in the background. Oh well. <laughs> I 
And she says, probably because we chat. That could be. Can, can you guys see your name in green too, though? Or is that just me on my end? One other tip I can give you about foiling, uh, when you're doing textured glass like this, when you're on the flat side, I always like to keep my fid nice and flat, <clears throat> excuse me, pressed tight against the glass. But when I'm doing the rougher side, instead of using it flat, I tip it on an angle like this so that I've got a narrower edge and it can kind of skip and, and get into all those little dips and, and valleys between all the little bumps of glass. I find it works much better for me. Take a sip of water. <clears throat> Pauline's second lead piece, any advice? It's 18 by 31 inches, I imagine. Um, any advice? Uh, I don't know. Is there something that you're having difficulty with? When it comes to uh, lead, uh, leaded stained glass pieces, I've been doing that for about seven years I guess now and uh, I still am well personally I'm much more comfortable with the copper foil I don't know if that's just because I learned the copper foil first and so I'm biased towards it now um, but the lead it can be super nice for doing certain types of projects anything that's a little bit more intricate I still kind of revert to the copper foil um, because the lead I just find can be a little bit uh, intimidating to me when it's got a very very intricate design and uh, I also want to get a proper lead knife I've just been using the the lead cutters and I find that getting those nice angles those long skinny angles on the lead is a bit challenging with those little cutters so I'm thinking a knife might might bode well for that Do you always start from the bottom left on the panel and work your way through? I'm better with foil too. Yeah. Um, trying to think, where do I usually start? I think, it, you, well, you definitely want to start in a corner. Uh, when you're working with lead, you want to start in a corner for sure. And I always start with the uh, framing around it. So if I'm using zinc, which is usually what I use around, uh, I'll, I'll lay the zinc out and then I'll work inside of that. And then... Yeah, you just, depending on how the design works, that you can keep tacking it so that the pressure of what you're working on, it kind of pushes down tight into the corner. So if you're working across like this, and then all of a sudden you've got an upright piece, well, you I would do something here first, wedge it in there, and then do the next tall piece and wedge it in. And then, yeah, you kind of progress across the piece in whatever order seems to make sense for the shapes of the pieces you're dealing with. Every pattern is going to be a little bit different, uh, but that's that's how I would go about that. Okay, so there's not too much left to do here. I've got the six white ones, two more clear ones, and then the little beads. And the beads, I'll show you how I do those too, um, to burnish them really, really easily. It gets a little bit noisy, but <laughs> it's, it's a very, very good way of getting it done. It's very efficient. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, so does that help with the question about the lead there? Uh, if, if you have any more questions about it, I'm, I'm happy to trying to answer that for you. And if you notice when I'm foiling a piece, I always start near a corner. You can start wherever you'd like, uh, but I like working near a corner because I can, once I turn, turn the glass, it kind of wraps around that corner and it locks everything in place so I don't have to worry about it sort of slipping or pulling away or moving while I'm trying to lay down some more of the foil. I'll show you on the next piece that I do. It's funny how we develop uh, our own ways of doing things and we often do have 
our own logic <laughs> might not always be the best logic, but we have our own logic as to how we do it and why we do it that way. And I'm a firm believer in uh, there's not always necessarily one right, right way to do things. Everybody has their own style and their own techniques and things work better for different people. So whatever your approach is, is fine too. That's just something I've kind of got in the habit of doing was always starting in the edges. So there, see, here's a bigger one. I don't have an excuse. I just didn't line that up properly. It wasn't because it was too small. Unlike those little tiny blue tri uh, squares that I was doing before. Okay, so those are done. So bring those ones over. Oh, you're most welcome, Kasha. Hopefully that helps, and good luck with your project. Don't, don't be uh, too shy to share it in the group if you'd like. So you can see here where I started. I have my, my diamond shape here, and I started about a half an inch down on the one side, and then I squish it against the glass, and then I can just pull the foil around, and it just locks in place. There's nothing sliding around or anything. And if you're anything like me, foiling is just one of those parts of the process that you have to get through. It's not very exciting for me. <laughs> it's very tedious, actually. And uh, especially this time of year when I'm sort of producing and producing and producing pieces, I often have a TV playing in the background with shows that I've already seen so that I can listen to them and enjoy them. But I can keep my eyes on what I'm doing here in front of me, but it just gets a a bit dull <laughs> if you're foiling for hours on end. Only a couple more. And then I'll show you those beads and I'll plug the iron in and we'll get to soldering these guys together. I went, to, I went to the eye doctors this week and I've been complaining for a couple of years. It's like I can't see details up close. And finally this time he gave me a different prescription. So I, I'm going to have reading glasses now, <laughs> lucky me. Um, but I'm hoping that it's going to make things when I'm working, you know, in this sort of range, make things much better and a little bit easier to see all those little details that I'm probably missing right now. Do you always hand foil or do you use a foiler sometimes? I always hand foil, always have. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I have a little uh, foiler that I bought. It was one in a, a lot of things that I bought um, used, but it was too small for any of the foils that I was using. So I bought one of the Glass Star, I don't know what they call it. Um, it's a hand foiler, it looks like a stick and then the foil feeds through it. And then you can use that to wrap the glass a little bit easier and it lines it up for you. I've seen in many Facebook groups, uh, people talking about the tabletop foilers. And I know there's a few different ones out there that people do like, and I've never tried them. I've never, never been in a room with one to be able to try it. Uh, I don't know. I'm quite comfortable with foiling. So I don't even know if that little hand foiler thing is gonna be any benefit to me. Uh, I don't know how quickly it goes doing it with a little gadget, be it the handheld one or the tabletop ones. I have no idea what the difference it would make to the speed of me being able to do things. So it's definitely something that I want to try. And like I say, I bought that little one. I just haven't had a chance to, to try it yet. So I will, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll record it kind of like an unboxing <laughs> and I'll put that on YouTube. Um, 
I was going, I was planning on doing a, a YouTube video with it, but maybe what I'll do is I'll do it quite, kind of as an unboxing and see if I can figure out how it all works. Cause it, it does look a little bit not involved, but you kind of have to get the hang of what it is first <laughs> before you actually become efficient with it. I don't know. Are any of you guys using any uh, foilers of any kind? Just type it into the comments there and, uh, We'll see which ones people like. Angie says, <laughs> I'll buy focals and still take my glass off to see better. Yeah, see, the thing is, <laughs> he did, the, the eye doctor was saying that to me too. And he says, well, how, do you find you're taking, you just taking your glasses off? And I, I'm like, no, because I can't see anything. I don't have my glasses on at all. Um, so just for the heck of it, he, he had me take them off. And I had, it was a little bit of text. There was like, I don't know, six or eight letters on a piece of paper that it was held a certain distance, but there was lots of space between the letters. And I'm like, yeah, that's no good. I said, cause I can kind of see that there's a letter there. Not that I can see what it is. And then over here, there's a big blurred black spot. It's like I was seeing double, but one was clear, clearer and the other one was absolutely not. It was quite funny. So yeah, I got a new prescription. <laughs> I've, been, I've taught a lot of people who they, they come into the studio and they're like, oh, I forgot my glasses. Let me run out to the car and I'll go grab my reading glasses. And I mean, I wear glasses. I have since I was about 16. And so I understand the need for glasses, but uh, never quite understood the need for different prescriptions for, you know, distance and up close. So I don't think I could necessarily fully appreciate what they were struggling with, <laughs> but I do now. You're fast at hand foiling. It's practice, Angie. I've been doing it for years. And I, I, like I say, I don't know if the little foiler things would be of any benefit to me. Uh, but maybe they will be. I really don't know. Sarah has used the tabletop foiler and it's much faster and accurate. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Uh, is it a specific brand? I know there's a, a bunch of different ones. And this one is the Glass Star Table Foiler. All right, I just bought a Deagle brand tabletop foiler. I've used it only a couple of times. Seems to work better on larger pieces. Keeps the foil centered well. Yeah, that's that's why I was kind of curious to try it uh, myself and see how well it worked, uh, just for the the placement of things. But uh, you can call me old school. I'm a hand foiler. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't mind it. Like I say before, it's, it's mundane and boring and, you know, I'll have things going on in the background that I can listen to as I'm working, but I just always accepted it as part of the process. But if everybody's saying it's that much quicker, then definitely I will look into seeing what I can do to try it out. <laughs> it's a cute little bun. I'm there with glasses, Angie. <laughs> Okay, so for these little gems, now these are, <clears throat> excuse me, these are small ones. Uh, your standard ones that you usually find, the ones I've always used before, are a bit bigger. I have some on the other table. Let's grab one. So this is the size that I usually have around, and then these are the ones I use for my snowflakes. So <clears throat> the larger ones are about three quarters of an inch, just under, and the smaller ones are about a half inch. So for your snowflakes, if you're making smaller little ones like this, the small little beads would do you well for that. And it looks like I'm gonna run out of foil. Let's see, I might have enough to get through these. Now, I also wanted to show you these, I do grind these. So you, you can see, if we can get the focus. Let's see if I put the ruler, maybe it'll have something to focus on. There, so see how it's all glossy and then the edge is kind of hazed out. That's because I've ground the edges, but I just do one quick pass all the way around on the grinder or all the way around the bead. Um, I, don't, I don't actually try to make it perfectly round. I like the kind of organic shape that you get with them. And certain ones will have a more perfect shape than others. I bought this one bag of these bright blue ones like this here, but they're really irregularly shaped. So you can see that and and they're not even like they kind of have little points and not corners but they they come up in peaks in areas so they're obviously not as smooth as the other ones but 
again, they add that little bit of organic character to the pieces. So I like to just leave them a little bit irregular like that. Okay, nearing the end. Oops, there's quite a few comments here that I missed. Sorry. <clears throat> I have the blue one. It helps me center the glass. I have a hand trimmer. Um, is that the one that I was referring to, Sandra, the, where it's um, it's like a stick? The glass. I think it's glass star. Uh, a stick that has the foil running through it. Lori says, I'm not sure if the price is worth it. Watching you foil, it seems like you hardly burnish the foil down. It seems to really rub quite a bit on each section of the foil. Um, okay, I'm a little lost with your comment there, Lori. Uh, when I'm burnishing, I am rubbing it and making it flat and stick down really well. Does the um, the foil applicator that you're that you would use does it already burnish the foil edges down a bit for you, or is it just lay it on there? I always thought they just laid the the foil on it for the placement, but didn't actually it didn't actually do anything else. So maybe I've always misunderstood the, the concept behind those. Yes, the glass, the little glass blobs here, I did grind them. How do you hold on to a blob to grind? <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> um, so I always just, I, I pinch it between my first two fingers. I lay it on the, 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 the tabletop. What can I use here? Let's pretend this is my my grinding bit I just lay it on the table where can you see there and I just I kind of go like this and then I grab it again and then I work my way around so it takes three or four different sort of positioning grabbing it in different positions to be able to get the whole edge but yes I definitely do grind them um, and you can see that there's a little bit of frosted effect there on the edge so I when I'm grinding it and and I don't even have one to show you because I foiled all these. But you can see that the amount that I've ground on this little glass bead is not as thick. Like it doesn't create as much of a, a, a as wide of a line as what the thickness of the glass is. And that's okay. I just want to make sure that there's an area on that that's all roughed up that is going to hold the foil. Check this out. I'm right at the end of my foil roll and I think I have just enough. Hopefully I didn't miss any pieces because of, and then I won't have enough. I'll have to go grab another full roll. There we go. And I know that working with little pieces for a lot of people, it becomes very uh, challenging. And if I'm doing a lot of little stuff and I'm on the grinder, especially when I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm kind of grabbing it and turning it around and then turning it again, my hand gets very tired and I, it's like I get cramps in my hand. So I can't do that for a really long time. But uh, yeah, it has to, I just have to sort of do it in stages and break it all up. So let me see before I move on if there's any more comments here. Sandra says, yes, that's in response to the blue one. Help me, Sandra. Okay, so that was about the foiler, and I was asking if it was the glass star, and you said yes. Okay, so that's good. I'm, I'm, uh, that's the one I have. I'm going to give it a try. And this one says Sharpie and burnish. Yes, yeah. Um, okay, so the table foiler just lays it on there, and then you use a Sharpie. Yeah, and I know a lot of people do actually use the Sharpies as their burnishing tool. Um, I, that kind of thing would drive me nuts. <laughs> That's just my personality. I would hate to pick something up and have it all kind of like worn and, and gouged and stuff. It would just drive me buggy. Um, so yeah, it's a personal preference, but yes, I know a lot of people do use the Sharpies and actually in the beginning, my husband turned me on, we, he had a lathe at the time. He turned a wooden, like different wooden dowels, different shapes and different sizes. So I could try using that, but I found that the, this, the wood, um, it kind of cut into the foil a little bit, or the foil cut into the wood, I should say. So it might not have been quite the right thing, or maybe it's just because I had gotten used to the feel of the plastic one at that point. Okay, so I'm going to clear some of the space here, get that out of the way. I don't need any of that. All right, so this here is just a box. It's one I bought, I don't know, at a craft store, a dollar store or something years ago. 
and it serves a couple purposes in my studio. One is that's how I burnish my beads. So uh, you see I've got a lot of beads in here and it's because the more beads you have in here, uh, what we're gonna do is drop these guys in, close the lid and shake it like a maraca basically. Um, and what's going to do is all these pieces are gonna bump into each other and they're going to burnish these nice and flat. So you can see here, they're very crinkly. Okay, they're not burnished at all. Um, so I'm just gonna close this. I'm gonna mute my microphone for a second because it's gonna be really, really loud and I'll come right back. So I'm just gonna shake the heck out of it uh, until I get those pieces nice and smooth, okay? There we go. We should have sound again. And we'll just take a quick peek and see what they look like. And we wanna make sure that they're all burnished down nice and smooth. And there's still a few, the edges look a little bit crinkly. So I'm gonna give it just a little bit more. So I'll turn the sound off again. And so then it's just to kind of separate them, find them inside the, the, the bunch here. But these look much, much nicer. So that's a very quick and simple way to burnish those beads. And you'll notice that I did some separate before. That's because I wanted to make sure that I knew which blobs went with which uh, snowflakes. So I should have six clear and three blue ones. There we go. Right, so the other purposes I use this box for, you can see it's actually got sort of like singe marks and stuff on it. And that's because when I'm building things that are square, like boxes or anything like that, because the corners are square, I can actually take two pieces of glass, place one on either side. Oh, you can't see that in the angle of the camera. So if I place one on either side, then I could use like my soldering iron and come in and, and tack them so that they're in a perfectly square shape. So I, this, this box serves a couple of purposes for me. All right, so we are all done uh, prepping this. And uh, my husband's trying to sneak into the room here. <laughs> oh, you heard the door squeak. Um, so uh, we're gonna get right into soldering. So I'll just move this back and bring this over here. And I'm just gonna grab my iron and plug it in. As I fall over my chair, which is very good. Okay, I've tried different things, some specifically made for burnishing, and I always go back to popsicle sticks. You know, I did try popsicle sticks in the beginning too, but I don't know, maybe it's because they were just El cheapos, <laughs> as we would say, um, they they always seem to just split and splinter. Uh, I didn't have much luck with that, but maybe those uh, the bigger ones. Is it regular size popsicle stick you use or big ones? Because the big ones, I could see maybe they're a, a harder wood. That or it's just because the the ones that I got were uh, a cheaper wood. Barbara says I use a small Rubbermaid or Tupperware container. Works the same way. Yeah, exactly. And actually, it might make a little bit less noise <laughs> because um, with the plastic, I'm sure the sound would would dampen as it hits hits the the side of the plastic. Whereas with the wood, you're getting the beads hitting each other and off the wood. I, I don't know. I just out of uh, politeness decided to turn the the put mute on so that you didn't have to listen to that clanging noise because it would have been very very loud. I'm sure on the video. All right, so. I know some people solder without any gloves or anything. Uh, I don't like to have the chemicals on my skin. It is marked corrosive on the bottles, so I always wear gloves. So I'm just moving some of the uh, solder and little bits of wire out of the way that I was using the other day. So my iron is beside me here and it's warming up. And, oh, actually there was one thing I wanted to do. We can do this while this is warming up. So let's lay this one out. We're gonna do this guy first. So whenever I'm working on something like this, I will go ahead and tin all the pieces first. 
Uh, if I'm building like a, a solid sun catcher where everything is touching and you're working with seams or you're doing something larger, I never ever um, tin them first. I always just go straight to soldering them together. Okay, so the bigger popsicle sticks might be the answer there. Thank you for confirming that. I use half of a wooden clothespin. Oh, that's a neat idea. Works great. I'm sure it would, yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to show you guys is, and this is something I haven't actually done before, but I thought it might be fun to try. So I have all kinds of crafty things around. So I also have these little craft punches. Okay, so it's just a little metal punch. I pop this off the bottom. You can see it's a... Uh, so it's this shape here, it's a little snowflake shape. So I thought what we could do is on this one, um, I'll punch some foil and we'll stick those on there and see if how it looks when it's done. I just thought it might be a way to dress it up and try something different. So this here is a sheet of copper foil and it's made for doing um, like overlay and, and things like that. And so it's a heavier metal. So the gauge of the, the sheet is much thicker than what you would get on your rolls of foil and I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to punch these and it's the same idea as regular foil so it's got the the backer on it and then obviously the back of the foil is sticky uh, but the stickiness of this foil is much stronger I find than the regular uh, rolls of foil would be And this is meant to punch paper. <laughs> it's jamming up a little bit on this foil, but I only need one more, so hopefully it'll work okay. There we go. Now we'll come up. Okay, so I'll put this away. This, this could be a total fail as far as these little punched pieces go. Uh, but I thought it might be fun to try, like I said. <clears throat> so here are the little snowflakes. They're just tiny little guys. Whoops. And they're getting away from me. Um, and what I'm going to do, this is the glue chip glass. So it is textured on the one side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn them over to the back side. And then try and stick these little guys down on there. And I'm going to use my knife to try and separate this a little bit easier. And this is where... Being able to see fine details up close <laughs> would be awesome. Okay. Ah, I dropped it. I'm gonna get my, my little tweezers here. It'll be easier than using my fingers. Okay, and I'm just gonna kind of put it off to one end. And we'll see how that works. Hmm, I don't know. It certainly looks sparkly right now because it's uh, the copper. If you have a larger punch, it might be easier. <laughs> but that was the only one I had that looked like a snowflake, so thought we'd give it a try anyway. Okay, so we've got two more left. <clears throat> yeah, peeling the tiny edge is a bit of a challenge, for sure. <laughs> Especially when I can't see it. There we go. All right, one left. Okay. 
Well, that one's not perfectly centered, but that's okay. So I'll just grab my fit and make sure these are burnished down really well. So uh, yeah, I had chosen this one because this design was a little bit more simple. I thought that I would uh, try and jazz it up a little bit with the, oops, dropping my knife, with the extra little punched out detail. So we'll see. I'll just put my gloves back on. Before I do that, I'll have a sip of water. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, so now we need to lay this out. And I don't remember exactly what it looked like. So the idea of having the phone with the pictures on it makes it really easy. So, all right, so these, I want the snowflake toward the outer edge. And so that means they're not quite touching in the middle. If I bring the other end down toward the center. So the key with using this sort of little grid thing that I created is to make sure that both of the points on the long ends are on those lines. And that'll make sure that everything stays nice and square for me. All right, so I've done that. I'm still gonna have to pick them up too. Tin them anyway. So let's get into adding some flux here. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm just using a flux. Uh, it's a, uh, this one a liquid or a gel? I think this one's a gel. And I just use a little chemical brush to put it on there. And what I do is I actually put electrical tape around my brush. So I cover the whole thing. Because this is that, these are those ones that they're the little silver handles on them. And if you don't do anything to protect the metal, if you use it for a week, it's gonna to be toast. It's not gonna to hold together anymore. Your little hairs are gonna start falling out of the brush and it's all gonna get all rusty and, and gross looking. So what I do is I, before I ever use it, I take electrical tape and I wrap it up the whole handle. And then I also take the, some scissors to the end because the bristles on this thing are usually about this long. And that applies way more flux than is actually needed. So I trim it off uh, to a bit of an angle like that. And then you're not wasting as much flux and you're not applying too much all the time where it's going to sputter and spit up at you. Okay, and I can't look at comments. Uh, let's see here. I don't wanna to touch my mouse with the dirty gloves, so. Um, I missed what kind of foil you cut stars. Uh, those are, that is a sheet foil and you can usually buy it at most stained glass supply places. Uh, it just comes in a sheet and it's, as I mentioned before, it's typically used for doing like foil overlay and things like that. Uh, when I bought these, uh, there was no brand on them. So I honestly cannot tell you what brand this is that I'm using, but as I mentioned, it's a heavier foil than what you would have for your copper foil tape. And it seems to be much stickier too. It really adheres quite well. Okay, and here I've gone and placed them all again and I want to, <laughs> <clears throat> and I want to uh, tin them first. All right, so let's get this going. So these are small pieces and I'm going very quickly and that's because I don't want it to heat up too much in my fingers. I'm using a 60-40 solder and this iron is the Hakko FX601 which has become my favorite. I used to use a Weller 100 all the time and swore by it. Great tip about the electrical tape. Good, I'm glad you like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll help preserve your brush, make it last much longer.
So I'm just basically going around the whole thing and tinning it, making it so that there's no copper showing. It's all gonna be silver. I am not worried about building anything up to make it strong just yet. That'll come later. This is just to make sure that everything is covered and it makes it easier to, um, when you're working on something that's not necessarily flat, it allows you to make sure that you've covered every space and you don't end up with any copper accidentally showing later on. Now, the only thing about those, um, the little snowflakes that I punched out of the foil and stuck on the front is that it's a silt, it's a copper back foil. So on the back, you're going to see that the, the little snowflake on there is copper and the finish is going to be silver. And in all honesty, I'm not even sure if you can get that in a different color backing. I don't use them that often, so I'd have to check into that. Ouch. It's getting warm. There we go. And there's a comment here. Why do you like that? better than the Weller. Um, you know, when I first started, I used a Weller 100 and I swore by that thing and I loved it. It did everything I wanted it to. It was a real workhorse. And um, I had a student, I'd, I'd seen this on the market and I had a student come in and she said, um, it's a student that uh, she was already doing stained glass. And she said, I bought a new iron and I don't really know how to use it. Can I bring it in? And uh, you look at it with me. So I said, sure, bring it with you. And so that, this is what she had brought in was the hacko. And I thought it was quite interesting that you could play with the temperature uh, settings on it. Like right here, there's a little adjustment here. So you can change the settings for the temperature. Right now I've got it set to 360. That's usually where I work. Um, unless I'm doing something decorative, then I'll turn it down. Um, but, uh, I don't have anything against the Weller. I really don't. I never had any issues with it. I loved it. It was a great tool. It kept up with me. Uh, when I'm doing large panels, I can just get in there and solder a whole bead and just go at it and it keeps up with me. So that's great. And I always felt a bit in the beginning when I was playing with the Hacko, uh, well, number one, I could, I always forgot that I could adjust the temperature because you couldn't do that on the Weller. You had to change the tip on the Weller to get a different temperature. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I started playing with it and using it for odd projects. When I had something serious that I was really trying to get done, I'd pull out the Weller. And when I had time to kind of fiddle around with things a little bit more, I'd pull out this little guy. And, uh, when I say little guy, it is lighter, it is smaller, it's more compact. You've got the finer tip on it. Uh, I believe you can buy different tips for this one. I haven't. So I, I really am not hundred percent sure of that. Um, but it's just this one, because I can change the temperature, it's become a little bit more, uh, useful for me when I'm doing a lot of the work that I have been doing. Um, so I do custom work and I also sell online. I don't do much in the way of shows or anything anymore. So my custom work are usually bigger panels and what I do for selling online, because I don't like, didn't like the idea of the headaches of shipping glass uh, through the mail. I do a lot of smaller pieces that I sell in my Etsy shop and stuff. And um, <clears throat> because I'm doing smaller things, the smaller tip is nice, but because I'm doing more decorative things and I'm doing more decorative solder on pieces, I like the ability to be able to change the temperature. Uh, in the beginning, when I first started using this, I was so happy with the Weller that I kept saying, oh no, if I want a workhorse, I got to use the, the Weller. And you know, if I want one to, to play with, I can, I can use this one. But I've gotten to the point, I don't even pull the Weller out of the cupboard anymore. Uh, I was always afraid this wouldn't keep up with me. But again, it's because I kept forgetting I could change the temperature settings. So if I'm working on a bigger panel and I'm using this iron, I just turn it up a little bit higher because I like to work quickly. I, I can run a bead of solder and keep going and by turning the temperature up a notch, this one will keep up with me. Um, whereas when I have it at the lower settings, it doesn't keep up. It doesn't put out enough heat 
to be able to allow me to run those beads the way that I like to. <clears throat> so that might have been more than what you were <laughs> asking for, Sarah, but uh, that's, that's really what it comes down to for me. Um, is your cord forever bent opposite direction on the iron? Mine is. Always wanting to turn the other way. You know, <laughs> I've noticed that in the last six months or so. I don't know how it was originally. Uh, I just figured it's because that's the way I always put it in there. So it kind of warped that way. But may maybe it did come that way. I I'm not sure. But yeah, I do have to turn it over. Um, that doesn't bother me so much, though, because I don't know if having my hand on the top um, if that button would be in the way, if I would feel that and feel that it was a bit awkward. So I don't really mind having it kind of upside down, but I also hold my hand over top. I know a lot of people hold their hand underneath like a pencil. So that makes a difference for me. Put another snowflake on the back. On the back of where? <laughs> I don't understand what you mean, Angie. I've got these, this is the backing. Uh, that was an extra. Did, nothing fell off. Like I have six six on here still. I don't understand. If you could elaborate, that would be awesome. 50-50 <laughs> or 60-40. I use 60-40. Um, I have a roll of 50-50 that I bought, I think, two years in to doing stained glass. And uh, it's still there. <laughs> the only thing I've ever really used the 50-50 for is when I'm doing three-dimensional objects. Um, I make those little sand pyramid things. Uh, you know, the triangular shape, you put sand and, and seashells and that in them. I use the 50-50 just to put one coat, one like one pass uh, on the edges to seal it. It gives me an extra second to play with stuff uh, when I'm trying to get the solder smooth at the end. Uh, but I've never really, I also have a roll of, what is it, 63-37, which I was told was a good one for decorative solder. It too is sitting there. Um, because if you have the control of the temperature on your iron, you can uh, adjust for those things a little bit easier. And then I just use the 6040. And there's more comments coming in. Okay, so this is a video only for liberals, or does that mean we're going to see how to make snowflakes? The title threw me off. Live snowflake workshop. Okay, I see the winky face. I know that's supposed to be humorous, but I'm not following, so <laughs> I apologize. I like that flux brush. Where do you get yours? Okay, the flux brush, I already um, described that a little bit earlier on, and that was so that um, it's just, you buy them in the hardware store. Uh, they are typ the typical chemical brush that you would buy. The, the handle is silver, and what I do is I wrap it with electrical tape. And what that does is it, prevents the, the, the metal from corroding and rusting, and then all the little hairs falling out so quickly. These brushes, I can actually use them for probably about, I don't know, four to six months until they get really, really nasty looking, and then I just decide to start a new one. But yeah, it does extend the life of them so that you can get more use out of them. Okay, so this is more or less what I'm going for for this piece, I think, isn't it? I don't remember now. So I'm just going to refer to my picture, what, what the design was. And yeah, that's more or less what it was. So that's what we're going with. Let's see the copper it might look more finished. Oh, I get what you're saying, Angie, to put another one behind it. But then I have to kind of fiddle with it to make sure they're all lined up perfect because it might, I don't know, we could try. We'll, we'll see how far we get. Um, but yeah, that was to address the issue of the foil showing copper on the back. All right, so you have two options when you're putting something together like this when it's a loose free form kind of thing. Um, you can use pins. Now I'm working, this is um, a piece of cork. So I can actually put pins into the cork right through the paper if I wanted. Or you can do uh, it this way. And the way that I'm gonna do it is, and you won't see it properly on the angle for where the camera is right now. But what I do is I bring my iron and solder over, I'm gonna try and drop a, a, a ball of solder right here, okay? So I bring them over that area, line it up, and then I just push them together, and I'm about an inch above it. And you just push it until a drop falls off. That way, you're not accidentally bumping something by coming in close and touching it. 
And if it spills a little bit somewhere, it's not a big deal. Solder won't stick to glass. So we can always go back in and move it around or clean it up later. So right now what I'm doing is I'm just tacking this together, just looking to get enough solder on there so that I can move this and have it all one piece. Okay, so it's not solid. I can't pick it up and start playing with it, but it's enough that I can move it around now. It's okay, I'm not that funny. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> okay, good idea, thank you. I haven't done glass in ages. Is your solder lead-free? No, this, lead, this solder is not. Um, this is a 6040. And I do have lead free, and the only thing I use it for is jewelry. Uh, when I first started in stained glass, well, maybe a couple years in, I decided I would try doing some jewelry, and I bought some lead free solder, and it was brutal. <laughs> it didn't flow. It it just got it's like it was sticky or tacky and you ended up with all these little picky things sticking out and I just could not get it to smooth out. Um, and so I kind of gave up on that idea and thought, well, I just won't use the, the lead free anymore. But I did uh, try a lead free again a few years back and I didn't see any problems with it. So I don't know if they changed their formulation or if I just had a bad brand to start with. I don't know. Now something I'm noticing here, I'm not sure if you guys can see it or not. It looks to me like it's a little out of whack. Like it's a bit off center on this side. And by lining it up, you can see the distance. See the distance from this point. Oh, you can see my big finger in the way from this point to here and this point to the center and if you go all the way around some of them are closer than other ones this one's really far out so i'm gonna just undo that one and move it closer just because that's gonna bug me so i'm just melting it to loosen that piece get all the excess solder off and i'm holding it up off the table so that that piece has a little bit of gravity uh you know let gravity do its work and it'll help pull things apart without breaking anything. So we got one side free. There we go. So we'll try again. Get this line back up so I know where the center is. There. That should be there. And do remember too that I said that my pieces weren't, um, they weren't cut perfectly to shape because I was rushing a bit, but having your pieces a little bit off can be nice. It gives it that more organic feel. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure that this is all melted in nicely around because I dropped those blobs of solder from the air kind of thing. They sometimes can sit up a bit. So now I'm just going to go to the back side, add a wee bit more solder to these areas just to reinforce them a little bit. And then I'm gonna go around the edges and beef that up, make them stronger. So I'm not worried about the prettiness right now. I'm just trying to make sure that it's not gonna fall apart or bend or break when I'm doing anything. And the nice thing about having a few projects on the go when you're doing little things like this is it will get hot. Um, and so, Right now, this is a bit warm, so I'm going to put this aside and I'll start another one and then you can kind of bounce between them to uh, to finish them off. You should see my brush. <laughs> I know when I first started, I didn't I didn't think of doing that. And uh, I can't remember where I think I saw it in a magazine or something somewhere. Um, and it wasn't to do with stained glass. It was just an idea that I thought, oh, that would work. And so I tried it. And sure enough, it does. It helps protect it enough so that things don't rust out right away. You can buy a black backed foil. Okay, that's great to know because I wasn't sure if the sheets of foil, like this one here, because this is what I used for it. It's a, a large sheet. It comes in 12 by 12 pieces. Uh, I didn't know if that was available in the black. So I did use all black backed for all of my edges here on all these pieces. And I don't remember what this design looked like either. So 
I'll just open up my phone and get my picture of the draft piece. Which one is this? Uh, no, it must have been the first one. Let's go all the way back. There we go. So this is this design. So I need to lay the diamonds out on the lines. Okay, and do they touch in the middle? Oh, these, okay, these ones are, these are the diamond shapes that I made that they were a little um, like oblong kind of, not quite like a teardrop, but they're, they're not symmetrical end to end. One end is longer. And I think they do come down and touch in the middle. So we'll do that. So again, I'm just using these lines in the grid to make sure that both ends of the piece are lined up straight to give me the right appearance for that angle. Make sure it looks, looks the way it's supposed to when it's done. Whoops, where's the line? Oh, and I've done it again. Okay, let's get these tinned first. Okay, so the tinning can go quite quickly. So this glass is textured, so when you're passing over the textured area, it may take a little bit more heat to let it flow in there. But like I said, I'm trying to work quite quickly here. those back in place. Okay, so we've got flux on all of these and we'll just pass over them quickly. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not trying to beef this up yet. I'm just tinning it just to make everything look silver. the pressure of live video yes <laughs> definitely although all of my big orders and everything are all finished so this this live stream is going to run a while um and i was prepared to allow time for it and it's also because i didn't have enough time to prep to to prepare them beforehand so considering i did all the foiling on the video here today it took up a bit of time too so but since uh, this is the last thing that I was committed to doing this week for work stuff, I, uh, I don't mind if we take a little bit of time. But I know you guys are pressed for time too, so I don't want to take up a whole afternoon. Okay, so these are all tinned. Get these lined up. Oops. All right, so just so that nothing slips or moves, I'm going to just drop a blob or two in the center here. Let that all stick together. 
and then I will do these little guys. And then when I put them in their places, whoops, <laughs> I got flying glass here. Um, <laughs> when I put them in their places, I don't have to worry about bumping into one of these diamond shaped ones. So that's good. It would be helpful if the Facebook feed would automatically scroll for me so I can see all the new comments. <laughs> Okay, here's a link to a site where you can make your own graph paper. Concentric circles are an option. You can save the distance between circles and how many times to divide the circle. That's very helpful. That's perfect. So as I mentioned earlier, though, I will be adding this, uh, this template into the video. Uh, not into the video. Into the group, sorry, in the files. And I'll give you guys the link for, the, for that to, to download it. And the way I made this one, it was using the idea of making concentric circles. And I think I did them at uh, a two inch, three, yeah. I think I went from two inch to seven inches for the sizes of the circles. And then I just had it subdivided into the six uh, lines going out to give the equal distance for the angles for placing your pieces of glass. But that's neat that there's a site that'll do it for you. <laughs> okay, working with little tiny pieces, it can get very warm very quickly. If, you, um, if you're very nervous about the heat or anything like that, when you're working on the top and bottom edges, you could always, instead of using your finger like I do, you can always use a pair of pliers and do this if you find that easier. Um, and then for the edges, I know a lot of people have different ways of doing it. You can use, um, uh, what do you call them? I think they're called bulldog clips. They're, if you see them in, in offices for, uh, they're like a big binder clip kind of thing for holding paper together. Some people will use those. You could use um, just a piece of wood that has a slat in it and you can stand the little pieces in there. Or you could even use um, clothespins to uh, basically to hold the glass vertically like this so that you can solder the edges. Okay, so now I can place these ones in here and not have to worry about anything else moving on me because I already tacked that all in place. There we go. So again, I'm going to come in just a little bit above it and just touch that on there so that nothing moves. And again, I'm not worried about how pretty it looks or doesn't look at the moment. I'm just trying to get it all laid out. So these little beads, I'm not going to be able to put on there until the snowflake itself is finished. Otherwise, I'll end up burying, you know, the center area where I need to finish soldering. And I don't want to do that. Oh, there's new comments. I'll check in a second for those. Now the reason I do these ones separate like this is again, it's just to be able to tin them and make sure that there's nothing left showing for the copper. Uh, whoops, I use it all the time. I also quilt, so it's great for designing that too. It's funny how a lot of us uh, who do different crafts and things like that, how uh, you find one, one website for one use and uh, it actually translates into many, many purposes. So that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure people will find that site helpful. Those gloves would drive me crazy. I have to be all hands on. Well, um, I do find that you'll see me every now and then I'll be going like this and it's because I'm stretching it. The gloves are just a little bit too big for my hands. 
but I have to get the bigger ones so that they're long enough for my fingers. Um, but uh, yeah, I won't use the flux on my, I won't have the flux on my skin because it, uh, I have eczema and that on my hands. And plus it, it does, it is marked on the bottles that it's corrosive. So um, I've always worn gloves when using it. But they're not thick. These are like a like a latex glove, so I can still feel everything. You can feel the heat for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not it's not thick, thick. So I'll just come back into the come along the back side of this here and just tack those spots down to make sure that those little squares are secure. And now I'm gonna come around and start building this up a little bit. And I'll clean up those little blobs that I've put on there too as I go. What's great about doing snowflakes is if you work on the one edge that's flat, you can kind of just keep tipping it uh, like a Ferris wheel, you know, going in one direction and then uh, doing all of those flat edges when they hit that flat spot where it would be perfect to, to do it. And then when you're done going one direction, you can just turn the piece around and continue, but you'll be hitting the opposite ones. So that way you don't have to worry about losing, losing your place or not being able to keep track of what you've done or not done. And see this one's built up, so I know I've already done that. So now I'll turn it over and I'm gonna do what appears to be the same ones, but they're actually the opposite ones. When you're doing the edges, you definitely want to add solder. You want to build it up. If you look at the edges before you solder it, it looks very square. Like if you look at it this way, it would look very square. And once you put the solder on, you want it to be kind of rounded. You don't want that square, square edge anymore. There we go. Okay, so I'm just going to do, I've got these ones in here, so I'm going to do them. The angle of the camera. It's hard to pick one angle to show you everything and have everything show clearly in a video like this. That's why I do a lot of them pre-recorded because I can stop filming and change the camera angle and set up and set it up differently for whatever I want to show you. Okay, and I see we have some new comments, so I'll get to those in just a second. Okay, let's we'll that cool for a second and see what people are saying. Bulldog clips are a good idea. Yeah, I haven't tried them myself. I imagine they would probably uh, start to corrode though, so I, I don't know, but they're painted, so maybe they wouldn't. I'm really not sure. Do you use anything to ventilate while soldering? No, I don't. Um, my ceiling is, I don't think I've ever measured it. Uh, it's probably about 15 or 16 feet near. Um, and the room is a good size. So I don't worry about the ventilation like that. In the summer, it's usually opened in here. If I find that the fumes do get to be a bit much, um, there is a bathroom kind of in the, the room. And I can just leave the door open and put the fan in there for a little bit of... Uh, air movement if need be. <laughs> no gloves just lets you know how many tiny little cuts you have. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can imagine. That would burn. <laughs> Brave soul, Angie. <laughs> I'm not sure if they even had this type of gloves back when I first started doing stained glass. That was 37 years ago. Wow. Yeah, I don't know what they would have used or if they would have even, you know, been as concerned about the chemicals then. I'm, I really, I wouldn't, I don't know. So yeah, as I said, these are, these are nitrile gloves. They're, um, they're often referred to as a mechanics glove. 
So they're, they're very similar to the latex, um, but because I have so many allergies and I don't want to develop an allergy to the latex, uh, I decided to stop using those and I found these instead. And what I like about these is compared to the latex, the latex ones, you use them and then you go to tear them off or, you know, or take them off and they tear. Uh, they're not very thick. And so you kind of get one use out of them and then they're garbage. Whereas these, I can actually do probably four or five solder soldering sessions with them before something happens, before they tear. Uh, occasionally I'll, you know, I'll, I'll prick my finger on something and so then I've got a hole and it's not, uh, it's not as useful then, but for the most part, I can get quite a few sessions out of them. So I just, whenever I'm washing, washing my project, I kind of wash these off too. And then I just leave them dry and I can use them next time. All right, so I've gone all the way around this on the front and the back and all of the edges. And I'm going to actually, before I put these on the front, I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna finish the back on this one first. So this is a little bit of a decorative technique that you can use. And it's great when you're using, um, trying to solder something where you have all these converging lines uh, because what happens is your solder tends to get really ugly looking because there's so many lines coming together. It kind of goes everywhere. So in this case, what you can do, and you can use a brush or a Q-tip, um, probably even a little sponge if you had one, dip it in flux, get it ready. And I, you saw that I put a little bit of excess solder on there. Maybe I'll put just a little drop more. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is when this is molten, we'll heat it up, and when it's still liquefied, you just kind of dab at it. Don't stab it because it'll spray out everywhere and you don't want that. But just warm it up and then just dab a little bit. And then you get this kind of, I don't know, feathered effect. Uh, it's not gonna show very well on the video. Um, and you can play with it until it looks the way you want. So I find that looks kind of bulky in the middle. So I'm going to warm it up again, and then I will just tap until it, it feathers out the way I want it to. Now, it's kind of um, not controllable, <laughs> so you just have to keep doing it until you get the, the look that you want, because you're just kind of pounding some chemical on there while it's still wet, or molten, sorry. It'll, um, it seems to take on a mind of its own, so you just have to be mindful of how hard you're pressing and how much chemical you're using. And then you can get a bit of a, a fluffy effect. So that's one way you can finish it. Now the front I'm gonna leave flat because I'm gonna put these three beads on here. So what I'm gonna do is I will tack them together on their own first. And I'll just do that by dropping a blob in the middle and then touching around the edges here. So when you're playing with your designs and you know little cardboard pieces of paper or paper pieces around, uh, you can grab some gems or globs or blobs, whatever you call these, and throw them in the mix too, and then you can play with them. And there's nothing to say that you can't um, stack the glass too. One of the other ones I'm gonna do, the glass is stacked quite a bit. So now that these are attached, I'm just going to Hold it and touch the solder underneath where they meet. It's getting a bit warm. I might have to leave this for now. Yeah, I'm gonna leave that. I'll come back to this one after it cools a little bit. So what else do we need to do with this one? I have to do all the edges on this. Okay. So I'll come back to this one and finish this off. Before I do that, we have four new comments. Let's see. I'm more concerned with heat, especially when I'm working with small pieces. It doesn't take much. When you're working with a small piece, uh, it, it'll, it'll take the heat and there's nowhere for it to disperse. So it just kind of holds it all right there. So I agree. When you're working with small stuff, heat is an issue. Um, you could put these together first without, um, that's what I'm looking for, without tinning them. And then once they're all kind of stuck together and they become a bigger object like this, then you could go ahead and do that. I just find, uh, for me, I like to do it with the tinning first for these. But like I say, I'm not one who tins everything. I don't tin things usually at all unless I'm doing something that's kind of a, a loose shape like this. 
And even here, this bead wasn't completely tinned. Okay, so I'm just kind of, I'll show you this way, going in and putting the tip of the iron kind of in those little nooks just to melt the solder and let it flow and even out. And if there isn't enough solder on one of them, then I'll, I'll add some more. But so far, I put enough on there already, so it's, uh, it's melting out nicely. Okay, so now I'm just going to do these little flat edges in here and build them up. And actually, you know, with these little, with these ones were the, my goodness, <laughs> all the words have escaped me. Um, the copper foil that we punched out with the snowflake uh, punch, the back side of it being copper on here, it actually kind of gives a nice, a nice little contrast. So maybe that's something I might try again another time and make this the front. And then you'll have that coppery look on those where everything else is silver. Little things to try and, and play with. Okay, let's see here. I've worked in this industry for 37 years and we never worried about gloves or fumes. Yeah, you would get a yearly lead check. I do too. I've always gotten my blood levels checked for lead. I uh, never had issues, same here. But I also think there's anything wrong with those who want protection. Yeah, no, and, and that's the thing. I'm, I'm not wearing gloves because of the lead. Uh, I'm wearing the gloves because of the chemicals um, and my skin is just so reactive. Um, if I were in a tiny little space, like in a basement with a low ceiling, I might consider ventilation, but because I'm in a large room and nothing is ever coming up directly in my face, I don't, uh, I don't get overwhelmed by that. I have my students wear protection. I wouldn't ordinarily use. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Teach them how to be safe. <laughs> that's a good thing. Aluminum foil crunched up a little works well for texture too. Oh, that's neat. I've never heard of that one before. I'll have to give that a try sometime. I don't have any uh, foil here with me right now to be able to do it uh, today, but I will definitely give that a shot. Thank you. Uh, where do you find the tiny gloves? Okay. I have collected these over, you know, years of searching for them. There are some glass suppliers that carry the globs. Oftentimes though, they're the fusible ones, which means that they're going to be a little bit more expensive, most likely, uh, but not for certain. So it might be worth checking. Craft stores carry them. Uh, years ago, the dollar stores had them all the time. So every time I went into the dollar stores anywhere, I would always check out what they had for these glass beads. They were usually where they would have like the floral type crafts. And um, if I saw a color I didn't have, I'd buy the bag, <laughs> you know, for, for a dollar a bag. And you'd probably get, I never counted them, but there must be about maybe 80 or 100 in a bag. Um, so you're talking a penny a piece really. And so uh, I would always buy them when I saw them. So I've got a big stockpile of different colors. Um, you can buy them in craft stores. Uh, I've bought some at Michael's craft store before here in Canada. I know uh, the U S has Michael's as well. The one thing that I would caution you is if you're buying globs from uh, anywhere, really, if you're buying red ones for some reason, um, I guess they can't make the red, glass the way they want it to look for those or some other reason they paint them red so if they paint them red and you are grinding them you chip into that paint and then you've got basically a clear glob inside with red paint on it and um it doesn't look so pretty when you're done <laughs> especially if you're using that uh, shaking the beads in the box thing like i was doing before uh, that would really damage them 
so if you see a bag of red ones and you pick it up, inspect them to see if there are any scratches. If there are any scratches in it, you can usually tell uh, if it's a paint or if it's truly red. But yeah, otherwise, it, craft stores, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe other people have suggestions on where you can get them too. But I always saw them with the, not plants, the, the flower arrangement type stuff. I think they were used like a vase filler or something like that. Okay, so that's, that's all smoothed out there. So for this one, I wanted to do something a little bit more too. Um, just trying to decide what I want to do. So maybe what I'll do is I'll do some little decorative drops here at the bottom and maybe put like a larger one on the point and then a smaller one on either side. So there'll be three or maybe five. I'm not sure. We'll do that in just a minute. Let's see here. Those are pretty snowflakes. Oh, thank you. Uh, the flux eats my fingers. I agree. <laughs> my skin does not like the flux at all. Uh, my aquariums are full of globs. Oh, that's a great idea, Angie. Uh, oh, because of the dollar stores. Okay, I thought you were going to say you bought them at aquarium places. Uh, more expensive, but you can get them from aquarium supplies. Perfect. Because glass is made using gold, too expensive for gloves, but sheet glass red contains trace of gold in it. That's why gold sheet glass is more expensive than other colors, yes. And it's also very hard for them to achieve a perfect red color in the glass. Uh, there is um, a store that I went to when I was first starting, and uh, they had some red sheet glass, which was discontinued. Uh, it was an art glass from... I think it was 70s, 60s or 70s. I think it was the 70s. And anyhow, uh, they had the full, well, the full sheet. I think it was a two by four foot piece. And the darn thing was a few hundred dollars. <laughs> it was just a piece of art glass. Like and I say just a piece, but what I'm getting at is it wasn't a window yet. It was, nothing had been done to it. It was just the glass. So yes, I totally agree 100%. The red glass is more expensive. Um, and you know, I think the yellows, the last time I looked, it seems to me that some of the yellows were quite expensive too, which I don't know. I've never looked into the um, the reasoning for the, the pricing so much. I knew the red was always more expensive because like you say, with the gold and everything, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know what happened with some of the other colors, but they seem to be more expensive too. Maybe it had something to do with that big fiasco a few years ago with the, uh, the glass manufacturers in the U.S. and the... Uh, I don't remember what the name of the agency was, but uh, whoever regulates the pollution and stuff uh, for the for the United States. Okay, so I'm just gonna try and get this, whoops, this last one started here. Oh my goodness, you guys, we've been at this almost two hours and you're still with me, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, I just realized that the, um, the, the counter for the time is up in the left-hand side of my screen. Uh, okay, and I don't remember what this one's supposed to look like. I know they were stacked. The big ones were on top of the, or the little ones were on top of the big ones. Let's see here. Yeah, that's it. All right, so that's the design we're doing now. I glove the right side out again. All right. Okay, and... The iridescent is the larger one. So, and these have textures. So I'm just making sure all the texture is pointing up because that's the way I would like it to be. Okay, and then these guys will go on top of that. And then these ones go in between. All right, so start by flexing this. Try to get through this part quickly again. Because flexing, not flexing, tinning doesn't take a lot of effort. It just is a step to do. Whoops, look at that. I attached them. <laughs> Okay, it looks 
looks like there's a new comment. Okay, let's see what it says. You maintain between 18 and 20 people the whole time. Wow, that's great. No one left. <laughs> Or, or somebody snuck out and somebody else took their place. <laughs> anyway, that's awesome. I'm glad that you guys were able to stick around for this. I've got this last one to do and then finish putting that other one together. I just finished tinning the edges of this. Yeah, so if you guys enjoy the live videos, I do have uh, my official membership club for make stained glass and you can find out more about that at makestainedglass.com and in that group um, you get free patterns every uh, well for the most part i've been adding uh, three or four a month right now for the patterns and so you get the pattern of the month you also get the tutorial of the month and then i do live videos like this and live videos are um they're geared based on requests uh, by participants and club members and sometimes it's a project sometimes it's a technique so i get to do these videos every so often well once a month for sure and so this month this is my third live video this month actually in the last two weeks this is my third live video at uh, the beginning of the month i was hoping to try and get this one done earlier in the month but with orders and the big Christmas rush of things that I had to make for customers, I uh, unfortunately had to leave this a little bit later, but we are getting it done. So there, so I just put a little bit in the center there just to tack it. I'm not even gonna try to pick it up because I will break something for sure. It's just to hold it together until I can get these ones on there. Now for this one, because the layers are stacked, I'm actually going to stack these pieces right on top. I need to make sure that everything is tinned because what could happen is because they're going to be overlapping, there will be parts that you won't be able to get to later to solder because the other piece of glass will be over top of that section. I see another comment. Where do you get your brushes? If we're talking about this chemical brush, uh, you can buy them at a hardware store and they are just a silver colored chemical brush. And I put electrical tape on the handle and it protects it from the chemicals we use so it lasts longer. Beautiful snowflakes, thank you. Oh, thank you for joining us, Susan. I don't know if you saw the whole video or not, but uh, at the beginning of this video, I did go over how I create the designs and, and a fun little way that you can use to make the, to come up with your own designs if you want. And so that was all explained at the beginning of the video. Okay, so I'm just tinning these. I'll build them up later. Okay, and I debated on using an iridescent white glass because I do have some in my scrap bin and I would have had enough to do this piece but as I said earlier on uh, as much as I enjoy the iridescent glass I find that it's easily overdone for my taste so because the clear one is iridescent I, I decided not to use the iridescent uh, on the white okay so I'm just gonna heat this up a little bit to make sure it's nice and flat 
so that when I lay this one on top, yeah, then that will work better. Okay, so the way that this one was intended to be done was to have these over top of the original layer that's down there. So I'm actually stacking it right on top of the other one. So to be able to secure this in place, it'll be like these beads when I go back to do those beads. Just move this one out of the way. Uh, I'm holding it firmly in place. And then anywhere that you can, uh, anywhere that the, the top layer touches the bottom layer where the, the foil shows, you want to attach them. So the peak of this one, I can attach to the peak of the one below it. And then on either side here, where they attach, or they touch, sorry, I can also put a drop of solder there to secure both layers together. Now, I would really like to pick this up to show you, but it's gonna be very fragile because I've only got that center tacked. So you see where the two layers are, one on top of the other there. Right here, where those two layers kind of meet, keeps wanting to focus on the table in the background. What do I have? There, now I can focus on the snowflake a little bit better. So right in here and in here, that's where I drop those extra little beads of solder. And that's so that it has somewhere to um, connect the two layers together. So if we look at it from the back, you can see on the edge there. So right, right along here, that's where I tacked it together. So now I'm gonna go around and do that for all of them. Careful that I don't break this when I put it down. Oh, we have some new comments too. Great workshop, glad you're enjoying it. Uh, the iron is set at 360 right now. And I mentioned earlier, that's usually where I, where I work with it. But it will, um, that will change, you know, from project to project, depending on what you're doing. And also, um, in the summertime, when it gets really, really hot, uh, I find the solder, it doesn't need as much heat. It's like it, it holds the heat a lot longer because it, it uh, there's no cool air around it to cool it down. So that would also affect what temperature you might use it set at. Okay, and there's a little feed under there making it roll around. Linda, just join. Oh, well, I'm glad that you could make it. We're, um, we're working on uh, snowflake number three here <laughs> and uh, just finishing up the soldering session here for these. Hello, I love the round guide you're using. What is it made of? It's just a piece of paper that I printed a template onto. I created the template this morning and I will be uploading it into the group for you guys to use. And uh, I just didn't have time to do that before we got started doing the filming today. So I will get that up this afternoon later this afternoon for you guys. And uh, the way that, uh, actually there was a comment earlier in the thread too that uh, someone, someone posted a website that you could use to make a similar sort of diagram or template. Uh, but this one, all I did is I, I made concentric circles and then I put the six dividing lines to show where the, the angles would go. And for snowflakes, it, is, it makes things so much easier. So again, I'm just lining up the, the second layer piece and then tacking it in place. Now, I'm, I've just been sort of tacking it to the middle because I have a layer that I can tack it to now, but I will be going back and adding all those extra tacks along the edges where um, the top and, and bottom layer meet up. So I'll do that after I've got these all somewhat into position. Okay, and the black marks on here, that's just a little bit of marker that was on there. I'm not sure why it's there, but there it is, and it'll wash off. Okay, so the second layer is on top. I realize this is a demo, but do you normally clean the flux off before assembly? No, um, because then you only have to put more flux on it to be able to assemble it anyway. So no, I don't usually, although I don't often do this sort of stacking, um, 
it might not be a bad idea to uh, to clean them in this case because it's going to be kind of blocked in there. But when I go to clean it, I will just submerse it right into the water. Um, and I have different brushes that I can use uh, for cleaning, like um, nail brushes and toothbrushes and stuff. And usually the the hairs will kind of get in between the layers like that. Um, but no, I don't I don't typically wash it off because I just need to add more flux to solder it together anyway. But that's just the way I do it. So now you can see a little bit easier here how I'm tacking the top layer to the bottom layer. And I'm just kind of throwing solder on there to make sure it's stuck. It's not super pretty, but we'll go back and, and touch that up in a second. It's just to make sure everything's nice and solid. Okay, those are all done. So now from the back, I can touch that edge, <clears throat> excuse me, and remove anything that's a bit bulky and excessive and also spread it out. Because I only tinned these pieces, I still need to build them up. So I'll go along and build those up, making sure that that connection between the top and bottom layer is still there after I've added some extra solder. So now this one, because it's a, um, it's double, double layers of glass, it's two layers, it's a little bit heavier. I can feel the difference quite noticeably. Just holding on to it. <clears throat> okay, so that's, no, oh, that's not quite it. Okay, that's it for the inner inner pieces here. So now I'll just go around the end of the outer ones and build those up a little. And then if I turn it around the other way, I can keep going and I'm going to be hitting the opposite sides of what I was just doing. The one thing about using um, straight pieces for sun catchers as opposed to the little round beads is they're much easier to solder. <laughs> it goes a little bit quicker. I'm just working in between the pieces now. This one's feeling actually quite sturdy, just the way it is, but putting those uh, those beads in between are really going to make sure that it's nice and strong. I think it's just because it's the two layers, it feels uh, less delicate than some of the others. Okay, and then I'm going to go around the inside edges of these big pieces and build those up a little bit. And it's starting to get warm, so I might have to leave it before I finish it all. Okay, so I'm going to put this one down and come back to it because it's getting a bit too warm to hold on to. Okay. So now this guy needs to be soldered on. Whoops. 
but this this little bit of uh, solder in the center here is kind of puffing it up. So I'm just going to remove some of it because because it's all puffy. I can't get the beads to sit flat. There we go. So again, I'm just going to drip solder along the edge where the two sections would meet to make sure that this gets attached on there. There we go, finally got it to touch. <laughs> And this part's a little bit hard to show in the video, but what I'm trying to do, and I'm making a bit of a mess right now, there's some excess that's running down inside, but I'm trying to get anywhere that the metal from these little globs on top touch against the metal of these diamond shapes below to try and get some connection between the metal uh, for the solder on all of those. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. And then, if there's any excess solder that has fallen somewhere it shouldn't be, then I'll, I'll take care of that after. And if it won't quite meet, you just add a little bit more solder. Okay, so I'll just come around and clean up around these little gems now, just so that it's not quite so haphazardly placed on there. Looks a little bit smoother. There. Okay, and so now I'm just gonna come in along these edges in here close to the center to clean up any excess solder that might have spilled when I was trying to connect the two layers. There. Okay, and it looks like I did all of the edges before, so that's good. I think that part is done. And I'll just touch this up here. All right, so this one is pretty much done. I do wanna add a little bit to it, so I'm just gonna come in and maybe add some drops of solder. So I'll add a drop on each of these seams. And actually, I think I'm going to try putting a little one on the tip here too. Whoops, fell off. It was a little bit too big, I guess. I'll try that again. Oh. Okay, I'll finish doing the drops around the front and then I'll turn the iron down and try it because I'd really like to try and get one up on those peaks. So I'm just uh, holding my iron so that the, uh, the tip of it is vertical and letting that solder kind of drip off the side and touching it down to the solder seam so that it sticks but doesn't melt right in. And adding these little drops can be just that extra little touch that you need to really kind of finish it off and pull it all together and make it look that extra little bit spiffy. <laughs> there. 
Okay, and I'll turn the iron down now. We'll give that a second to cool down. And uh, so this is what it looks like with the little spots of solder on it. So just adding an extra little drop on top of those seams. Sorry, I'm trying to get it centered in the camera here. And uh, yeah, so this one deceivingly looks a bit like a poinsettia, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Um, but I think it's because the little blue pieces with the, like it would be the green and then the clear would be the red. But anyway, I don't know. All right, let's see if I can get this to go on the tips like I was trying before. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I just thought it would be cute. There we go. So, and that's the versatility between the Hakko and the, um, the Weller. Oops, that one's not centered. I'll come back and get that in a minute. So it's just uh, learning to control how much solder you're picking up and putting onto your iron. Where's that crooked one? Here it is. Uh, yeah, learning, learning to control uh, how much solder you're, you're picking up and then different ways to apply it. And you can create all these little detailed effects there. So that's what it looks like with the little drops on the tips too. I mean, you could go to town and, and you know, put drops everywhere. Um, maybe I'll put three in the center here just to kind of tie that in. And then we'll call that one done after I put a hook on it. So actually I'm going to put this back up. Oops. Second one connected to the first one, which is not what I wanted. And this is the beautiful thing about soldering. A lot of people get scared off from soldering and they say it's, it's very hard and it, it is a challenge to learn, but once you get the knack of it, it um, it's really, I mean, even if you don't have the knack of it, it's forgiving. If you put too much on, you can always take some off. If you put it in the wrong spot, you can always move it. And um, I find it to be a very, very, very forgiving process. And you can change it and nobody even knows it happened unless it happened on video. <laughs> you can't hide. There we go. I don't have enough. <clears throat> there. Okay. So I just added three little drops right there. One, two, three inside there. So it's just an actual bit of detail. Okay, and we'll come back to this one. This one was done. I wanted to add drops on that, I think. Um, so this is the top. So the smaller ones are on the top layer and there's a little bit of a lip in there. I'll just clean that up. And then we'll move on to getting these little beads going. And that'll be the last thing to really attach uh, other than hooks and uh, just finishing them off with any decorative solder stuff. Looks like we have some comments. Did you not have to reflux to add beads? I haven't washed anything at any point. So there's already flux on everything. So I didn't have to add more flux to anything uh, because there was already flux on it. Um, what to use for hanger? Depends on the project. Uh, sometimes it's wire, sometimes it's little, um, not O-rings, what do you call them? Jump rings. Um, basically little silver wires that have already been bent into to loops. It's getting really hot. <clears throat> so for these, um, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to use for these ones. The smaller ones, I might use the, the loops. The bigger one, I might use wire. Um, and the only reason why I say that is because this bigger one is, is considerably heavier, heavier than the two smaller ones. So I think with the wire, I can actually kind of feed it back down inside so it's not going to tear off of a point anywhere. 
The other two I think are light enough. This one for sure is light enough to just use a little hook on one of the tips. Um, that one I'll have to decide what, uh, what I'm going to do when I get there. Don't really remember how heavy that one was. That's too hot. So we'll move on. Just get these last two semi coated here with tinning. They're not going to be perfect, but I can always touch them up when they're on the, the uh, when they're attached to the ornament. There we go. Okay, um, and I believe these were were they in between? <clears throat> just opening that up again yes they were in between there so i'm going to add those right where that one is but before i do that i'm going to take a sip of water because i'm getting really thirsty there. okay put the glove back on Okay, so these just go in between there. And get centered between the two top white ones, I guess. That would make the most sense. There. Okay, and I'm going to do the same thing I did before, where I'm basically going to add a little bit of solder anywhere where the two layers or the two pieces are touching. Now the, the, uh, the idea of constructing something like this is great for little objects. You wouldn't want to go trying to create a big panel or something like this because it won't be, uh, it won't be structurally sound, but for smaller objects that are just ornamental, it can be fun to play with adding things in different ways like this. Two left to attach, so we'll do that. And then this one. Oops. I have a big glob of solder there. Okay. So now that they're attached, I can go ahead and make sure that these little gem things are completely covered with solder. As you saw, I was struggling with the heat there a little bit. They were getting too hot to hold on to properly. So now that they're attached, I can finish them off. And so I added solder from the front to attach those, but from the back, there isn't, uh, on all of them, it, it doesn't have quite, quite a bit of uh, solder. So I'm just going to go back and add a little bit more solder on the back side of where those two attach, just to make sure they're well, well secured. Don't want anything coming loose later. Okay, and I see there's another comment, so I'll check that once I've got this, this here done. There we go. So now those, those little beads that are on there are going to be much more secure because they were soldered from the front and the back. 
Do you grind the, oops, I'm losing my spot here. Do you grind the edges of the beads before foiling? Yes, I did grind all of them. And um, I, gr I didn't, uh, when, when you grind the edge of a bead, you don't have to grind it back so far that uh, it makes a line around the bead the same thickness as your glass. Uh, I just do, you know, a decent quick pass around to make sure that I've got at least one little line all the way around that's roughed up so that the solder, the um, foil has a, a, gets a good grip on it and has something to hold on to. So now I'm just sort of going back over it and touching up anything I don't like the look of. Is it a liquid or gel flux? You know, I can't remember. I, th I think this one is a, I said earlier that I thought it was a gel, I think, but it's a little bit runnier than the gel. So I'm not sure, <laughs> honestly can't remember. I'd have to check the, the container. Um, what I do when I'm using flux like this, because this studio, like it's just, it's my studio for stained glass. So I don't worry about leaving the chemical out. What I do is I pour a little bit in here. So I'll pour like a half an inch or something in here, which I'm never going to use for one project, you know, especially if I'm doing little things like this. Um, and then I just leave it sit out because I'm, I'm soldering every day or two. So I just let it sit there. And what happens is it kind of congeals. I think some of the liquid um, evaporates and it gets a little bit thicker. So the consistency is always changing. And uh, honestly, I really don't remember if it's gel or if it's liquid. But I could check and let you know later that I could do. For sure. Okay, so I like the way that's going. And I guess these three were going to go on the top too, weren't they? I don't see what else it would have been used for. Let's double check that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yeah, so it's got the three little beads in the middle there. But I'm wondering, do I like, what do you guys think? Should I put all three beads in the middle? Like that? Or just do one? What do you think? <clears throat> I'll wait and see if you guys have any suggestions for that. And I'm just double checking over these pieces to make sure they are completely finished and then I'm happy with them. There's a little spot here that's not very pretty. Let's go fix that. <clears throat> this one I want to put drops on so maybe I'll do that while I wait to see if you guys have any recommendations of what what you'd like me to see like to see me do on this one here. And it looks like we have comments. One, 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 one. Okay, so we'll do one. Let's go back to that and get it get it finished. All right, so I'm going to pick the one that looks the roundest because the other ones are kind of oblong. <clears throat> Oops. Sometimes my iron gets hooked into the stand somehow. And when I try to grab it, I get everything. <laughs> Okay, so just doing the quick tinning of the little bead here. It's getting hot. Okay. So I'll try and get that lined up as best I can for the center. That's in the middle. And so I'll just make sure that I've got enough solder that kind of drips down and attaches to those layers of the white that's just underneath it here. Make sure it gets secured properly. Hmm. I want to connect on this side. There we go. OK, 
Okay, now, so what's happened here is when I was filling it in, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> try and get that out of the way <clears throat> so I don't have to keep clearing my throat. So in here you can see that there's um, nice space all the way up to the bead. And then when I was trying to get these ones to connect, it kind of dripped out a little bit. And I actually think I kind of like that look. Um, makes it look a little bit more connected in the middle. So I'm going to do that intentionally on these other areas here. And then I'll drop a couple of little decorative beads on there of solder to, uh, to fancy it up and uh, just add those little details like we were talking about. So the trick is to try and get these so that they melt out as far as their um, the other ones so that it looks balanced. Just move these guys out of the way because we don't need them now. Okay. And okay, I'm going to build this one out just a little bit more because it's a little bit smaller than the other ones. And let's see, how's that look? Do a little bit more on this one here, too. All right. So how's that look? Not quite balanced yet. Okay, so now I'll go back over them and I'm just gonna add, I try and add two drops on here. And if I turn this down, it might be better. My sponge is dry, I'm just gonna wet it real quick. A bucket of water on the other table, so it worked well. Okay. So I'm just kind of using the, the point on the corner of my iron to add these drops. And I don't know if I want to try and add two little ones. Might be nice. A bigger one closer to the middle and a smaller one toward the edge. Oops, that one didn't go where I wanted it to. Ah, that didn't melt the way I wanted it to. So I'll take that off. And this is where you can play with it for ever if you want to. Try and get everything looking exactly the way you want. There, let's see, what do you guys think of that? Can you see that? Do you like those little beads there on the side? Or should I just open it right back up, back to the center? Again, get rid of all that excess solder. Do you have one big blue? Not that's prepped. Um, that I was thinking that too when I was playing with that, it might be nice to have a bigger one, but I think three is different and interesting. Well, I do have three on this one, so we'll go with that because I've already got the one on here now. Sorry, I didn't see your comment earlier. What temp did you turn your iron down to? Okay, sorry about that, yes. Um, so the iron is set typically at 360 for me. That's where I like it. And to do the drops, I, I put it down to 310, which is the next lowest setting. Love it. Yes, to the beads. Okay, so, so I'll keep going with that. So yeah, it's still at uh, the 310. And just using the corner of the iron to add those little drops. This one wasn't built out far enough. I don't have room for a second one. So we'll flatten that a bit. And um, if you're adding little extra beads, 
you'll want to make sure that the solder gets a chance to cool underneath before you add the beads. Otherwise, the beads are just going to melt right into the solder that's there. So I just smoothed all those out just a little bit bigger because there wasn't quite enough room to balance those two on there. And now I can come back in and add those decorative bits. There we go, getting nice little round beads now. So you just take your time and concentrate on what you're doing. If you've never done these sorts of little decorative drops before, um, what I suggest is the easiest way for people to practice them without the fear of botching a project is if you just take two pieces of glass and make a straight seam right in the middle, then you've got something that you can practice soldering on and you can play with and you're not intimidated by making a mistake or messing it up. Because the whole idea is that you can just keep reusing that piece. So you can solder, um, you know, one day and then the next day you can take it apart and, and practice soldering on it again until the foil decides it doesn't want to stick anymore because <laughs> it might overheat eventually uh, to the point where you need to replace it. But for, for practicing, playing with practicing soldering, it's a, it's a great way to do it. And then you get the practice of putting it down and also taking it off, which can be helpful. I just, I botched that one. So I smoothed it out and I'm going to let it cool down and I'll move on to the next one and come back. And I accidentally touched the side of the bead there. So that didn't work either. There we go. Some days I have a bit of a tremor and it's very hard to do this sort of detail when I have that tremor. I don't really have it today, thankfully. It's there a little, little bit, but nothing too terrible. There we go. So there's two on that one. I'll come back and do this one that I messed up earlier. Oops. Okay, that was too much solder, so I'll just get rid of some. There we go. So now I've got two little drops of solder on each one of those, but this one doesn't look like it comes out as far as the other, so I'm just going to touch that up quickly. And I'll add another drop back on there, or two drops, I guess, because I just melted them both. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I'll let that cool a second. I'm going to add some fancy little drops to this guy. And then we'll get the hooks added and uh, see what they look like. All finished up. Okay. So there's just a couple things I'm noticing that I don't like, so I'm just touching them up quickly. comment I like the beads of solder you just did great thanks they're um they, they can be fun and they add those little bit of detail um but if you're trying to to do more than what you're really ready to do um it can be a bit of a challenge oops there's someone in our group actually um who does beautiful solder work. And she does a lot of the different, different um, decorative bead work, or different decorative soldering with the, you know, the beading on, on the pieces. Okay, so this one I'd said earlier, I was going to try and put a larger bead toward the center of these. And then trying to knock off just a little bit. And then I'll put two smaller ones on either side or maybe make it a total of five 
I was going to start with the three and see what it looked like. Oops. There we go. That's working. Okay, so those are the center ones, those are the bigger ones. So now I'll try and do a smaller one on either side. There we go, this is starting to look like something now. For some reason this one doesn't wanna get bigger, there we go. Someone's at the door and I have no idea who it is. And they didn't open the door either. Usually people just knock on the door and come in. So I don't know who it is. So there we go. That's the, that's with all those little drops in the middle. It just adds a little bit more detail. So I don't know, it's looking, I like that, but it's looking a little off balance now. So I think I have to do something either on the outside or maybe up around these beads um, to kind of finish that off. So I'll think about that for a second. I'll come back and just do the last two that I needed to touch up here. So again, putting one a little bit bigger towards the middle. I'm going for one a little bit smaller, just a little bit further out. There we go. So that one, I think, uh, you can get you can get so absorbed in doing all these little bead things everywhere. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to put, I'm gonna play, let's see. I'm gonna put one here, see what it looks like. I just can't seem to visualize this for some reason in this spot. If I can get this to cooperate with me. There we go. Yeah, so let's try that. We'll just do one on each of those. We'll aim for them to be the same size. I have to go back and touch up the odd one just to help balance out the size a little bit. Oops, that's not in the right spot. Okay, so I am, um, this one I think the flux is pretty much dried off on it, so I'm just going to go over it a little bit. And I should be able to drop those beads on there a little bit easier. There we go. And that one I think is a little bit too big. Okay, 
Okay, let's flatten that out and start again because I messed that one up. Okay, and yeah, I think that, that blends the inside with the outside a little bit more, balances it out. Some really loud cars outside right now. <laughs> okay and this will be the last one i'm just gonna go back and touch up that one i did previous because it's it's a little bit more imperfect than i would like there we go okay so that's that one all finished with our little snowflakes that show copper from the back and uh what, okay that one's done and this one this one is done but I'm wondering if maybe I should do a little embellishment maybe on the tip of each one. Just again to help pull that center out so it has a little bit more balance to it. So that's what I'm gonna try doing. Okay, so we got one. Two, although that one's not as big and round, so I'll try that again. There we go. And when I'm placing these little drops of solder, I'm not uh, not I'm trying not to touch too much of the foil with the iron. I just want to kind of make contact in the center, and then I let the solder fall off, and it. Um, it sticks where mostly where I'm touching and it won't spread out. If you heat up too much of the area of the copper, of uh, the copper foil, I should say, um, it, the bead will spread. There we go. Good. All right. So I think that adds just, just that extra little bit of detail on there. So these are done. I just need to add little hooks. So I have some jump rings here and they're just a nice size I find for doing this sort of thing. And debating if this one's a little bit too heavy. This one's good for sure. This one should be all right. So we'll do that. The other one I am going to, the larger one I'm going to do with a wire though. Oops. Okay, so using some little pliers that I have, I'm just going to put a little bit of flux and then I need to pick which point I want to hang this from and I'm going to do it from here. So just hold it in place, and tack some solder on there. and hold it in place for a second so that it, it cools in position. And then I turn it over. Now this one's got those beads on the back, so it's gonna kind of wobble around. Let's see if I can help balance it with another one, it's just so it doesn't move as much. Okay, and I'm just gonna grab that again and hold it in place just because I don't want it to fall by accident if I hold the solder there too long. Okay, and I'm just going to go back and smooth out that solder up there. Okay, so there's one. A little drop of solder there I don't like so there. 
So there's that one and it's nice and secure. And so for this one, again, I'm just gonna grab a little jump ring that I have, put a little flux and yeah, I was trying to decide if I wanted to hang it from one of the pointed pieces or from one of the rounds, but I'm gonna do it from one of the pointed pieces. hold it in place for just a second so it hardens and then I'll turn it over and do the exact same thing I did on the other one so just holding it again to make sure it doesn't move if I heat it too much and then just carefully touching beside it to clean up the little bulges that happen and that's on there nice and secure and so then for this guy, I need wire, which is just behind me. I'm going to grab it. Okay. And the way I'm going to place this, I'm, I don't want to put a hook just on the very tip here because there's enough weight to this piece that any kind of bump or anything, it could potentially tear that and 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 rip apart basically so i need to add a little bit more um, security than that so and i'm doing it on a round one again so let's see will that sit flat it's better okay so what i need then is a piece of wire i'm going to go from the center out and i will just kind of line all the way around this one uh, diamond shape if you will on the back to add that strength right into the center. It'll build, it'll build the strength right down into this ball of solder, basically in the middle that's holding everything so that the, um, the piece will be nice and solid. So I basically need this to be long enough to cover that whole piece and then also build out that little loop that'll hold it in place. So I just use a little bit of emery cloth. I don't use pre-tinned wire, not for any reason other than I have copper. So that's what I'm gonna use. So the emery cloth is like a sandpaper for metal and it basically cleans it up nicely. Add some flux. Using the solder, just heating it up. Now my iron is still very low, so I'm gonna have to turn that up. So back up to 360 for that. It'll take a second to get there, but we'll let it do its thing and we'll do ours. <laughs> okay, so. Um, it's still a little bit warm, so I'll give it a second to cool. I'm gonna put sponge on it to cool it a little quicker. Okay. So I'm just going to hold the wire. I'm not worried about up here right now. I'm, I'm worried about getting the center or the end of it tacked properly into the center. So. I'm just holding it however I can to make that middle piece kind of go where it's supposed to go. Oops. It's because I got that one bead on the back. It's just rolling around now. Okay, so let's get that in there. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to take this and make sure that the wire is lined up nicely. I aim for the middle. So if you're looking at the glass this way, I'm aiming for the middle of the glass, not the front or the back. And then I'll just hold it in place and add some solder to tack it down. And then you build up the solder enough to basically bury that wire in there and then you don't, no one will even know it's there. But you will and you'll know it's nice and solid and nothing's gonna fall apart. Now it will make this one piece appear a little heavier, but I would much rather have it so that the project is secure and nothing's gonna break apart. Um, and by doing this, I know it's going to be solid. So when I get up to the peak here, I'm just going to bend it up so that I can make the little loop part. And 
and it's easier to do this before it's completely soldered down because I could solder this edge and then try to bend it, but you risk um, bending it in, in a way that it pulls the foil and tears something. So I always try to bend that little loop before I solder that edge. Okay, and I will bury that completely after. I'm just trying to get it all in place right now. So a couple of drops on there will help hold it in place. There we go. So I'll just make sure that's nice and tucked in tight there. And then, oops. Don't like that. It's not going down the center here because it was, the bead was in the way and it was not allowing it to go right down the middle. So that's better. Tack that in place. And then now I can basically trim this off where it's gonna meet in the middle. And so I'll tack that end down so that it's not weaving around in the air. And then I'll just use my pliers, <clears throat> excuse me, to push this nice and snug against the glass and get that corner bent just the way I want it. And then we just come in with more solder and bury that wire. And with the wire in there, it's gonna take a few extra seconds to cool. Hold that cool a second and check comments here. And here's Samantha got busy and forgot about your live show. Can it be replayed on YouTube? It's going to stay in the group. I'm thinking about putting it on YouTube. It'll be a very long video. I've never done one this long, uh, ever, I don't think. <laughs> um, so it may end up on YouTube, I don't know, but it's definitely gonna stay in the group. So you can always watch it within the Facebook group here. So, but I'm glad you were able to catch the tail end anyway. But yeah, we are almost done. Learned so many tricks today, thank you. Oh, that's great. Like I said before, I'm just glad that you guys were able to join me and have the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have had about this sort of thing. So now I'm just adding an extra little bit of solder to fill in anywhere to balance that out and help hide that wire. And if you are ever building a project that is a very weak project structurally, then adding the wire around the project is basically done this way that you would just kind of lace that wire all the way around and embed it like I did along here. All right, one more little touch up over here. Oh. All right. Okay, so these are done. They all have hooks. Now, did you guys want to see them clean? Um, I got a bucket of water right on the other table. I can just uh, go off screen for a second and touch those, you know, clean them up quickly, and then you can see them a little bit more shiny. What do you think? Do you want to see them all done? Watch it on the Facebook page. Great. Good. Okay, so if you have any other questions about anything, uh, just go ahead and type them in the box. Like I said, it might not be uh, necessarily in relation to this specifically. If you have a question about stained glass that you wanted to ask, go ahead and type that in there. I'm gonna get this piece of paper off of here. 
So, and as I said before, I am going to uh, add this uh, file into the group so that you'll have the PDF so that you can print it out and um, use it to make some of your own in the same way that I did. Okay, I'm getting lots of yes comments here to see them clean. So I'm going to go off screen just for a few seconds here. You might hear water sloshing around and I'll come right back. Okay, so these are all washed up now, and let's get my gloves off. Unplug the iron. And I'm gonna finish drying these up for you and show you what they look like. I just didn't know if there was anything else that anyone was asking. So. I'm seeing here, are you going to patina? No, these ones I'm going to keep silver just because I thought the idea of having them silver and hanging on the tree, because um, they're a nice size for a Christmas ornament, the silver reflects nicely with the lights in the Christmas tree. So here is number one. So there's the first one. And this one has just the little drops of solder in the center and a couple of drops around the edges. So they're not polished, I've just washed them. Uh, and I wash them, I have a bucket of water uh, already prepared with um, NutriClean. It's a product for cleaning the patina and cleaning the flux off of anything. So here is the second one. This one has the little snowflake cutouts on it. This one actually turned out quite cute. So there's this one. So it's a little bit different. So yeah, the, these were done with the little punch, don't forget, in case you missed the beginning of the video. So I just used a little crack punch and I punched out some copper foil sheet and stuck those down. What do you clean with? Yeah, so I've, I've already answered that question. That was fun. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all you guys too, or whatever uh, the holiday you're celebrating. Oh, wow, you're still videoing. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> uh, but we're just wrapping up now. I'm just drawing off this last project to reveal the final piece all cleaned up with all the flux and grossness off of it. And Beautiful. Thank you so much. I enjoyed every minute. Learned a lot. I guess it's no flick making day tomorrow. <laughs> well, I hope you have fun making your own. And it's a really sort of creative way to just let loose. If you cut out those little bits of paper in the beginning, then uh, you can design your own. And like I said, if you have kids around or grandkids, nieces, nephews, they can maybe even help design one and uh, take ownership of it that way. Whoops, this is still dripping. <laughs> because this is double layer it's going to take a minute for the water to finish dripping out of there and what else do we have here what did you stick them down with i'm sorry carol what did i stick what down with are we talking about these little um snowflake cutouts here that i was saying that i punched if that's the case it was punched out of 
a sheet of copper foil and it's sticky on the back, just like your regular copper foil would be. So you can actually see here where I punched the holes in it. And it's just got that backing on it, just like your regular copper foil. But this stuff is really, really sticky. It seems to be much, much stickier than any kind of foil I've ever used as a roll of foil. So I just, I punched them out and put it on the clean glass and stuck them down and burnished them. And the uh, adhesive, perfect, that's what it was. Um, so yeah, it's just the adhesive from the back of this sheet of foil that is holding it down. When you're doing anything uh, with those, um, when you're using the, the copper sheet and you place them on there, I don't know if anybody noticed, but when I was soldering those, I was going a little bit quickly because I didn't want to melt the adhesive. So I just kind of touched over it quickly with the solder. I mean, I did use the flux on it. So there was flux around it and they haven't lifted, they haven't moved or anything. So, and that was even in the bucket of water with a, a washcloth. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're on there quite well. So, but it's, it's not the same thing as your regular roll of foil. Those ones, if you were to punch them out and put them on here, you'd probably have to glue them down with something later because I don't think they would stick. If you had to glue them down, um, try and think what, I mean, I have glue that I use, but it's a specialty glue and it's heat set. You can use UV light or heat to set it. Um, you could probably use, I wouldn't use crazy glue. Crazy glue dries out and if it gets warm, it will actually separate. So I used to try to do things with that, it doesn't work very well. Uh, I know that one from experience. I know uh, E6000 is a glue that a lot of people use. Uh, I only ever tried using it for gluing bales to jewelry. So that's like the little metal hook that you put on the back of a pendant so that it could, you know, be stuck together and then hung on a chain. And um, I never had much success with that for that purpose. I know a lot of people use it for that, but me, myself, I never had much, uh, much luck with that. Uh, you could use a silicone. Uh, I've used aqua, not aqua grade, what is it? Marine grade silicone. Um, and you can get that at the hardware store too. Well, at least that's where I get it here. Um, but you would be buying a, a large size tube for whatever you would need for just gluing that down. But it might be useful for other things too. Happy Festivus. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so I guess that is it. There's, um, there's a few more comments, more of thank yous than asking questions. So I'm glad you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I enjoyed it too. Uh, it was nice to have all the questions and the interaction and we've actually reached three hours if you can believe it. Uh, and we've got the three ornaments finished. So um, we've got it where we've got like an opening in the middle with these extra little bits on with the, um, the copper foil sheet. And then this is where we layered the beads in the middle and everything else is kind of flat. And then we also did that quick little uh, technique in the middle with the uh, molten solder and the flux brush. You can tell my brain is starting to shut off. <laughs> Um, and then we have this guy, which is actually a double layer of glass. Sorry, that's not high enough. Double layer of glass, beads on the bottom uh, layer, like table height, and then the bead in the middle, and then all these little detailed beads around. And then we also did the wire that went all the way around that piece so that this hook is absolutely secure and it's never going to break off. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you find it useful. Even if you're not making snowflakes, maybe there's something in the video that you learned that will be helpful for other things. So I don't think I'll be doing another uh, video before Christmas. So as I said earlier, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and all that. And um, I'll see you guys again in the group at some point. Uh, thank you guys so much for participating. Bye for now.